Welcome back to the Metal Exchange. Justin and Chris here with you for another week. Episode 125. My friend, how are you? Um, wow. <laughs> 125. That's That kind of came up quick. Uh, yeah, yeah. Wasn't expecting that to be the number, but uh, I think we uh, we chose a good band to talk about for episode 125. Uh, we did, and and it's an it's a band that we've talked about um, in the past. But I feel like this band has kind of reinvented themselves so many times that it's con- it's going to be a very fresh discussion as we talk about uh, Imaginarum. But we'll we'll get there in a little bit. Um, very very interesting week. Uh, we we recorded our last episode just a couple of days ago, as uh, you had been a little bit under the weather. And then a peek behind the curtain, we'll be recording our next episode in a few days as we uh, celebrate our mutual friend's 40th birthday um, next weekend. So we're actually going to be recording about three episodes in about six or seven days, which is <laughs> pretty unique for us. But looking forward to that, um, have you have you had a chance to listen to anything new in the last couple of days since we since we last spoke? Not a damn thing. Um, <laughs> I listen, I, honestly, I, listen, I, uh, I had to get some work done yesterday that... Um, uh, didn't get done on Friday because of the holiday, and so I spent the whole uh, workday listening to Nightwish. Yeah, I, I I don't blame you. I listened to this album quite a few times over the last few days. Um, I just have two things that I wanted to mention that I think are worth noting. Um, I had to- I had basically told you um, that I heard an album that the second I heard it, I, I thought of you, and it was one of those albums that. As I listened to it, I, I definitely enjoyed it, but this had you written all over it. And it's a band that we briefly spoke about a couple of months ago, I guess a couple of weeks ago at this point, and that's Fraternia. Their their new album, The Final Stand, is really, really good power metal. Um, in a year where power metal has been pretty down, in my opinion, there were only about a handful of releases that I was um, really enjoying. This was one of the better albums for sure. So if you, if you enjoy power metal... Um, this one is is definitely one to check out. I, I'm assuming you haven't had a chance to listen to it just yet. Um, I've heard a couple of the singles, but I haven't listened to the whole album as of yet. But I am looking forward to that, especially if you uh, if you think I'm going to like it. Usually, you're pretty spot on. So yeah, this one is it's it's good. And and another band that I know you enjoy came out with a single yesterday. Um, it's been oh, I guess well over two years since their last album, and the band is called Illumishade. Uh, and for those that aren't familiar, they're a Swedish band. Uh, the singer, Fabian from uh, Elevati, is the singer for Illumishade, and she does all cleans on this. Interesting single. Has that chunky guitar sound, but it's very melodic, very catchy. If you like their last effort, uh, I would recommend checking out the single and their new album. If you haven't heard them, definitely, definitely give them a listen. Uh, unclear, I think, at this point as to when the new album is coming out, but it's definitely something to look out for. I, I enjoy uh, looking forward to it. I, I'm assuming it's going to be released in some time uh, in 2023. Yes, they um, they released a, a handful of um, singles um, oh, okay. since the since the first album came out uh, in 2020, um, and um, uh, into the unknown, uh, destined path, and the endless vow. So a few tracks have been kind of sprinkled out. Um, since the first album, but I'm assuming that these uh, new tracks. I, actually, I, I'm pretty sure I saw the the post on social media that this was um, in or, or ahead of um, a, a full length album. So uh, that will be their second album. So looking forward to that. Um, I forgot who else is involved. I, I think there's some other some other notable um, names involved in this uh, project, which is like you said, it's kind of a, a side project from. I think at least there's at least two members from L80 that are a part of this, but uh, I'm blanking a little bit on who else is involved. Um, but yeah, I, I'm looking forward to hearing more from them. And I just downloaded the new single, which appears to have a, a minute and 50 second intro track as well. So uh, <laughs> I guess I'll have to listen to both of those and uh, chances are they'll be on a forthcoming playlist. So. I like it. I like it a lot. Um, but let's let's get to the reason why we are here. And, and you chose an album that I knew we would cover at some point. Um, we've already talked about Nightwish's Ocean Born back in the archives. Now we are talking about their second um, full 
length release with um, Annette Olsen on vocals. This album came out in 2011, November 30th to be exact. A very, very um, ambitious and in many ways polarizing album and time period for the band. Um, what made you choose this as the next album that we were going to discuss by Nightwish? Uh, well, I guess it was... Um, I, I could probably say that Oceanborn was my favorite of the Tarya era uh, Nightwish albums, of which there were one, two, three, four, five. Um, so five full-length albums with Tarya, and then she would leave the band, and um, uh, Annette would join, and they would do a Dark Passion Play, which I... I, I think we're going to kind of get into a, a deep dive about a lot about um, the, this album. And also I, I wanted to talk about the f- album that came out after Imaginarium, uh, Endless Forms, Most Beautiful, um, just because it, it's such an interesting time uh, of, of flux with this band, um, trying to kind of find its, its footing. And, and, and while the musical styles are, maturing you also have kind of a chaotic uh situation with you know who's going to be the the long-term singer of this band um so um you know like i said i think oceanborn might is probably my favorite of the the tariara albums although i believe wishmaster does come close and, and i really enjoyed century child i think once was the album where they kind of started to lose me a little bit um because there's some like like some of my favorite songs are on there dark chest of wonders and ghost love score just to name planet hell just to name a few but then some of like the the songs the other songs that were a little bit too kind of like mid-tempo folky where there wasn't just had a little bit of a technical glitch i think we're back you were talking about um Dark Passion Play, kind of picking up where Ocean, uh, where um, Once left off, all, just in terms of sty- stylistically, with some of those mid pace tracks. Yeah, yeah, there was just kind of like a very. This is, I think, where more of the kind of like folky kind of element that I think they really um, grasped onto with Troy joining the band later on. But um, that just stuff. There were songs that just didn't grab me. Um, on on both once and and dark passion play, even though there are other songs on those albums that are like all time favorite Nightwish songs for me, like Dark Chest of Wonders, Planet Hell, Ghost Love Score, and then on, on Dark Passion Play, man, I, I re listened to um, Meadows of Heaven. I forgot how sick that song is. That that was the the last track on, on Dark Passion Play. Seven Days to the Wolves is another all time uh, great. Nightwish song, in my opinion. Um, Amaranth is a great one. Poet and the Pendulum. But then there's this other songs where I'm just kind of like, eh. And, and so, like, for me, Imaginarium kind of marked the first Nightwish album since those early Taria years where I was like, wow, I love every single song on this album. This is the most, for me, the most complete Nightwish album in a long time. And I remember, you know, my friends Caleb and, and Amy both really glomming onto this as a matter of fact you know Caleb had gone to 70,000 tons uh while they were touring this album in January or February then so he saw them twice on 70,000 tons then came to Prague Power they played Wednesday and Thursday night saw them two more times there and then after he got home from Atlanta him and Amy drove to Toronto and saw them again because Amy hadn't started coming to Prague Power yet and she wanted to see Nightwish so Caleb saw them five times um, on that Imaginarium tour. And uh, I believe the show they went to was one of the last shows that Annette did with Nightwish before she would like just um, abruptly leave the tour and uh, ha- and leave the band and then Floor, Floor would jump in and take over. And uh, there's a lot of, there's just this, a, a lot of, um, a lot of going on at the time that yeah, this album came out. You know, out. it's funny. I, I looked back and we covered Oceanborn in episode three. So it was 122 episodes ago. And you and I, I mean, I wow. love Oceanborn. I had rated it an 8.125. I, I do think it's the best or uh, most complete Tarya album. You had rated it a 9.5, which I think speaks to just the level of fandom that you have for this band. 
Um, I'll be curious to see how this compares at the end of the day to um, to those scores for each of us. But you're right. This this was a state of flux. And I remember um, Annette leaving the band in the middle of the tour. And almost overnight, it was Floor taking over. And I said to myself, this had to have been in the works for a while. This was not like um, just calling somebody up and being like, hey, can you get over here and, and, and do the rest of the tour? This this was something that I feel like she was on standby, and 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 I I have no, nothing to back that up. It's just a feeling I have because it happened so fast, and they've never looked back. I mean, a floor, a floor has done an amazing job with the band, uh, given the material. I do I do wonder if if Floor didn't have a a work visa for the U.S. that she so she had played with Mayan when they played at Prague Power just a few weeks prior to her joining Nightwish. I, I wonder if that even would have been a, a possibility. Um, but she just happened to have that work visa um, that I, to my understanding is good yeah, for a year. Um, I, I, I assume I, it made it easier. I, I can't if, imagine if that else. that would have um, hindered things. I would imagine that definitely helped. Otherwise you'd, you'd have to think they were in line to possibly cancel the tour. I just don't know who would have come over with uh, the right credentials, especially if she was the long-term solution in the first place. Well, make a, make a note of this because um, I think we should post it during the week, but there's a very cool video of um, the, the, show, the, the show after um, Annette's last show. Um, Floor hadn't uh, gotten back to the, gotten to the States yet. I believe it was towards the West Coast. It might have been in Colorado or somewhere in that area so um since they had uh elisa from um the agonist now arch enemy and um elise from amaranth um on tour with them um they did their best to take you know take uh annette's place they had the the lyrics like printed out in front of them and there's a very cool video of the end of the show during uh last ride of the day um I can't. I think it was from this show, um, and like Tommy from uh, Seventh Wonder. Oh, I guess because Camelot was opening for them during that tour. Um, so Tommy's out there, and like there's just like this whole celebration of all these people. That one might have been from the last show on that tour. Um, I might be getting to the two confused, but there definitely is footage of um, the other two ladies uh, filling in for Annette on that one show before. Uh, floor would make her way over and, and Nightwish um, did a really cool documentary um, called uh, learn the set list in 48 huh. hours I think was the name of the the, the documentary and it, it comes on um, one of the the more recent Nightwish um, blu-ray uh, or DVD sets um, and it's it's just this um, I, I believe a net like refused to participate in it. So she's like rarely mentioned, but it, it goes through the whole process of floor, like getting the call and then having two days to like learn all the words. And um, it, it's really cool. Like, like just, and, and it really kind of uh, explains how the whole thing went down and, and how chaotic it was and just how good she was to come over there and, and, on, and on her very first day, like make it seem like she'd been doing it with she them for years. Phenomenal live, and, and I don't think anyone would dispute that. Um, I mean, we talked about that after Forever show that I saw with her fronting, and that was the first time I saw her live. And she is just such a force uh, in front of that stage; it's it's incredible. But let's get into it. Like I said, um, Dark Passion Play was a very good album. It's something that we should probably talk about at some point in the future. But to me, this album took a real step up just in terms of the cohesive nature of, of the way this album kind of flows together and the story that it's telling, it would ultimately become the basis of a movie, which in and of itself I have not seen, but I can imagine just based on the way that this album was constructed, it, it certainly makes sense. Um, I find that this album, perhaps more than any of the others, was just immediately catchy. I listened to it back when I first heard it, and I was immediately hooked. Um, whereas some of the other albums took a little bit of time for me to kind of warm up to. And ultimately I fell in love with many of them, but this one was just an immediate hit, a quick hit. And I knew basically from the opening notes of story time, which is the second track that you were in for something kind of special. You could just kind of feel it. Um, did you have that same reaction or was this something that took a little time for you to marinate? 
my recollection is that it was it hit me like a ton of bricks right off the bat. And I remember when um, Endless Forms came out a couple of years later, um, feeling like this this feeling of, of disappointment the first time I listened to it. It ended up growing on me to the point where I, I absolutely love that album now, but um, the first time I listened to it, it just didn't hook me the way this one did. Like there was something about um, just the the all the songs – even though there's so many different styles going on on this album, um, it, the way that it, it bounces around from like, you know, slow jazz to like, uh, you know, um, folky kind of stuff to like, just, um, you know, story time, which is the opening track. This is just, that's just like a, a symphonic power metal beast. Um, there's so many types of, of songs on this album, but yet they're all interesting and they all grab you in. Like, you hear that opening riff to I want my tears back and you're just, you're in like it's. And I also think that um, the, I have to say this is probably the most you're going to hear Marco on a Nightwish album. And I think that that's a a really good thing. I think that the dichotomy of him and Annette together, which if you ever go back to dark passion play and listen to the Islander, like that duet that they do is it's just out of the swirl. You you mean as an Islanders fan, I'm not surprised that you'd enjoy that. True, true. I, there's a bit of a bias there, but uh, same with Meadows of Heaven. I think that might be the, one of the most underrated Nightwish songs ever. I listened to it yesterday, and I was like, "Man, I forgot that this isn't just like a soft kind of ballad." Like it, the orchestrations, like towards the end of the song, get so, um, <clears throat> like uh, I'm going to use the word bombastic. Like it just, it, it's so um, emotional, and it's a, such an amazing song. So, like, I feel like there were. Um, there were kind of sprinkles of genius on that album with that lineup that I think the once, you know, you had, and that was fully in place at this point. And I think that they were able to write an album that was for her not like, I don't know how much of dark passion play was written for Tarya and was left over, or if they started all over again for Annette, I really don't know, but I just feel like it doesn't have the cohesiveness that this album and- does. I, I agree with all of that. What's interesting to me is just doing the comparison of what we talked about two years ago and what we're talking about now. This album, other than a nod here or there in certain parts of certain songs, sounds like a completely different band from the band that recorded Oceanborn a, less than a decade and a half prior. It sounds nothing like each other, and they're both great for what they are. But I think as I get older, I'm gravitating more towards this stuff than I am even the old Oceanborn stuff, just for personal taste. But they sound like two completely different bands. I find that um, there's like aspects of the actual instrumentation, like the drumming is similar because it's the same drummer and the and the riffs are kind of the, the similar because it's the same guitar player, but... Tuomas as a, a keyboard player and a songwriter, both ha- as you can, it's like watching his maturation as a songwriter and, and an, or- and an orchestrator and just how he, I think has become more comfortable with these grandiose, um, like orchestral and symphonic ideas almost to his own detriment. If you were, if we're going to go and talk about the most yeah. recent album, which I feel like was, I didn't dislike as much as a lot of people, but I still consider it a disappointing album. Um, I mean, if a Nightwish album isn't in like my top three of the year, it's right. disappointing. Right. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, this album was, I it wasn't keeping a list, but it was arguably my album of the year. I mean, if, if I had, it probably would have been my album of the year for 2011. I do believe it was Glenn Harveston's when he did his, uh, he, you know, he just released his annual list um, that he does. Uh, usually, comes out every Black Friday. Um, it was a good morning Black Friday when he uh, <laughs> released it. So, um, but uh, yeah, I remember this being his number one, which um, is is I, I I'm always interested to see. Um, I won't spoil it. Uh, I thought Glenn's number one was really interesting this year because um, it wasn't really in a metal album, but. Uh, Again, like I just feel like this was, um, I think this was on a, like just a lot of people really love this album, and I was definitely one of them. And and uh, I, 
I just, it brings me back to that kind of time in my life where I first moved upstate. I had just kind of made friends with like Caleb and, and kind of was starting with a new friends group. And I, all I know is that we played nice. the hell out I, of I, I, And I can see why. And yet I also know people that just detest this area or this time in the, in the band's history, which I don't understand. I mean, I know it sounds different. I just don't understand what there's not to like here, but I digress. Um, let's let's get into it. The the album opens with a song or an intro track called Taika Talvi, which I assume is obviously a Finnish uh, name. I believe it stands for um, – what does it stand for? I read about this once. That's it. Magic, Magic Winter. Winter. So, Wasn't that – was that the name of a Sonata Artica EP? You know something? You might be right. <laughs> At some I, that, point. That's actually, that does ring a bell. I think that that's, that might be where I heard it from. First, um, Marco, I think, is doing these vocals here, and they're in Finnish, and it really just serves as an intro track to story time. And I, I'm going to, normally I usually just go right into it with that first track or that first real track. I'm going to let you do the honors with story time. What, what comes to mind when you hear this opening, you know, full-length track? Um, Nightwish is, is, is here. Nightwish is back. Um, I, I feel like, um, Dark Passion Play didn't have the, this, like this kind of, um, I, I, you know, who's writes songs like these, um, uh, what's the guy from Kane's Offering? Oh yeah. Um, his, yeah. uh, his songwriting style, um, he, you know, that, that's the band, uh, he's, he was, um formerly of Sonata Artica and he uh and he does this uh, side project with Timo Colti Pelto Stradivarius yep. called Kane's Offering and there's they have songs that are a lot similar to kind of this style but it's just this like um really fast paced ass kicking power metal song that has this symphonic backdrop to it um and I feel like um I feel like maybe Bye Bye Beautiful might be the closest to this on uh, dark passion play, but it just doesn't hit the way this one does. Like this is a, an all time great. I think it's going to be a, a mainstay on their set list for probably forever. Um, it, it just, it, it's just like get you up out of your seat, um, get your fist in the air and just like, it just, it's hard not to get excited. Um, just an amazing song. Just a, a, a really kick-ass way to start the album. And, and I feel like, they kind of followed up. This was what they did, in my opinion, on uh, once with Dark Chest of Wonders, where they just started out with like this, just you know, banger right off, right from the get go, and then they would follow it up um, on uh, on Endless Forms. Um, and I, I will pull up the name so I don't screw it up. But the first track on that, uh, Shutter Before the Beautiful, I. I might even like that song more than story time. Um, that song is amazing. I, I was with you when they played their first, uh, uh, first show of the endless forms tour. And that song had leaked. And when I started playing it, I marked out, I was, I was like, I was jumping on you, like your show on your back, on your shoulders, like freaking out. I was so excited. Um, I, I the, the bourbon I drank prior <laughs> probably didn't hurt, but, um, I just remember that so clearly, but anyway, like this has kind of become like uh, the song that I look forward to the most on Nightwish albums, where it's just like that that st- kick things off with just um, a lot of energy and uh, and power, and and it almost kind of <clears throat> is good because it lulls you lulls you into a false sense of security. Because then, like the the as far as tempo goes, this album is like a wave; like it really goes runs the the gamut from like upbeat to downbeat to fast to slow to medium. Like there's so many different, there's so much, this album is really dense to use that word again, but yet not dense in a way that it turns you off. The yeah. First time you I, I agree with everything you just said. The story time was a song that I had on repeat for a very long time, just because of how catchy and how fast and melodic and crunchy it was. And even though I was always told never use a word to define itself, it does in many ways lend itself to the story here. And I think it's a perfect intro to what this album is, even though not many songs sound like it on the album, if that makes sense. And it does come in waves and it comes and it kind of takes you on a ride. No, no pun intended. Um, It's a great track. And one of the things that I love about it, believe it or not, 
is towards the last um, chorus, Annette does this little vocal solo, which I thought was fantastic. And it kind of just helps this, you know, part of that chorus just stand out from the rest. She sounds great here. And maybe it's a product of the studio. I think she's okay live. I don't think she's nearly as b- bad as some other people may, may you know, say. But she's just got a different style. She's not uh, Tarja. She's not trying to be. She couldn't be. It's just not how she is. And by the same token, she doesn't have the power or the, um, really, I guess the power that, that a floor does. So she's, when she sings some of the older material live, it sounds a little jarring and I completely understand that. But when she sings songs off the two albums that she was on, she does it really, really well. And I have to give floor credit because she is, um, diverse enough that she can pull this stuff off as well. But you know something? I wouldn't want Tarja to sing this stuff. I think it would sound pretty bad, to be honest with you. So that's a... Yeah, I I agree. I, I think that... um, I have to commend the band for going in a different direction instead of trying to find another operatic style vocalist, which I think can be limiting. They went with somebody who has a little bit more of a, maybe a pop sound to, sure. to her. I mean, I get... I think that the people that disliked Annette didn't like dislike Annette in and of herself. I think they disliked her because she wasn't Tarya. And that was the the knock is that like, you know, not only is she not Tarya, but she's a totally different style vocalist. This album was, I feel like constructed in a way to only show shine her, her, uh, you know, yeah, her strengths. I, I agree. Um, and, and and it's just, I think that it, I, I don't know. I, I have no issue with her and I would even go as far to say there were songs that I thought, and I, I have to say, I'm very, I consider myself very blessed to have seen them live with her because um, she was out of the band several, like two weeks after I saw her and the band, it was my first time seeing the band live at all was with uh, Annette at, at center stage in Atlanta. And, they played two nights in a row, but that first night, um, she I thought she blew – she played Dark Chest of Wonders, and she, she, like, completely knocked it out of the park. Then, But then on the opposite end, um, they did Over the Hills and Far Away, which, I mean, it's not a Nightwish song, but um, it's just not the same without Tarya's just, like, you know, classic, legendary, operatic-style vocals. Like, I just can't – I can't hear that song with night with Nightwish without her on it. So, you know, I think some things work, some things don't. Um I thought Amaranth was a oh, that was the song she already sang. Never mind. Um But uh I, that was a a highlight moment for me seeing Dark Chest of Wonders and she, I thought she absolutely crushed it. I, yeah. I enjoyed that a lot. But um the 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 stuff from this era, I mean, I thought she w- did great live and I've enjoyed um the stuff that she's done uh, since, since since she's left Nightwish, um, I, her first solo album I thought was a bit of a miss because I think she tried to kind of escape the metal thing, kind of like Kisk did uh, when he made Readiness to Sacrifice. Um, it was like kind of I think it caught people off guard because they were hoping for a metal album and they didn't get one. But then she, you know, her, the stuff she's done with Russell Allen and, and even her most recent solo album, which I think she collaborated with. Um, why do I keep forgetting this guy's name? The Kane, the guy from Kane's Offering. Um, oh, Yari uh, uh, Kapalainen. Yes, um, he had more of a influence on that, and I think that so that ended up being really good. I thought after her first one, it was actually kind of surprising how good the second was. So, uh, you know, without belaboring the point, um, I am a fan of her vocals, and while I think that. Floor is the ultimate Nightwish vocalist, and who should be the Nightwish vocalist? I mean, I I like this little era. It's it's almost like a, a blip. Now that you know, you could look back on it. It was just those couple of years, <clears throat> but um, I don't know. I enjoy her. So um, this was a great. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Kind of a showcase. I think this album was of what she could do and, and that she wasn't just a one note pop singer as, you know, we'll talk about when we get to like, 
you know, slow love slow, especially. But um, uh, what about your thoughts on um, the Ghost River? The way that this track opens with that opening riff, it's one of the top two or three riffs Sick. on the entire album. And it really does kind of feel like you're going on this Joan, like this boat ride down a river. I mean, I know it's obviously in the name, but it sounds awesome with like the spooky effects in the background and stuff like that. And it's the verses here are, are, are kind of simple, but with the orchestration, it feels bigger than it actually is in many ways. And I love the contrasting vocal lines between, you know, the, the male and the female singer, like going back and forth. I, I think Marco and, and Annette do a fantastic job here. They complement each other really well. Um, this was a song that has grown on me over time. I, I, I always thought it was okay. Now I'm a huge fan of this song. And it kind of reminds me of something that you'd hear at like an amusement park, which I, I love that feel. I just, I, it, it puts me in a good mood. And the contrast between Storytime, Ghost River, and the next song, Slow Love Slow, is so bananas. <laughs> but it's like, it's awesome. And I just think that the front half of this album is as good as it gets. I'm, ass- I'm assuming you have to agree with at least some of what I said on Ghost River. I agree with all of it. I, this is a great song. I, again, um, I thought this was a song that translated really well live. Um, a, a, lots of Marco, which is always uh, always a good thing. I mean, we miss Marco as the bass player of Nightwish, I think, but we miss him even more as the 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 second vocalist. Um, I, I, and we'll I'll get into that later, and I'm sure I beat it over the beat it over the head with it on, a, on a, the Oceanborn episode. But boy, that I didn't realize that was so long ago that we talked about that um marco to me is a, is a big is a heavy loss for this band even though you think who gives a shit the bass <laughs> player left but uh i mean i don't know um again and there was something about i feel like he never maybe there just wasn't enough time for it to develop but i feel like he didn't have as much of a um a, at least a, a a vocal rapport with with floor that he did with the net. There was something that was, I don't know, just felt more easy and natural with the two of them. Um, But I also feel like Marco was a, was starting to kind of get phased out as a backing vocalist. He's not really on human nature um, very much at all, even though he was still part of the band when that was recorded. Um, And I, that might be part of the reason why the album was disappointing to, to most. Um, but then you know you get to a song like this, and he's just front and center, and and I think it just adds such a great uh, element to it that Nightwish isn't just um, you know female vocals. There's male vocals in there too, and good ones. Um, I know Tuomas was hard on himself when he did the his own male vocals on the uh, the fir- the earlier albums, and he he's like he he says I, I can't even go back and listen to myself sing. It's so it's so cringe, and I'm like. It was serviceable. I don't think it was terrible, but you know, you're always your own worst critic, I guess. And Marco, I think, was just such a a wonderful choice as uh, to bring him in as not just a bass player, but as a vocalist, as he you know did for years with the um, the band that he did with his uh, his brother Taro. Um, it's again, like I'm probably gonna probably gonna just repeat this over and over again, but like it's it sucks to me that he's not. In yeah, I, 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 I agree. Um, definitely a loss. Um, although you wouldn't know it on, on a song like Slow Love Slow. This is maybe the most unique Nightwish song that they've ever penned. It is a true ballad, but not in terms of like a power ballad. This is a song where the keyboards and the bass lines are un- incredible. And it just makes you feel like you're in a jazz lounge listening to someone on stage while you're sipping an old fashioned. Like this is very Broadway, very jazzy. (laughs) Um, And while I think that there are songs that often are better live than on the album, this song is so unique that I actually don't love it live, but I think that the album recording is perfection. And I just think that it has this epic build that kind of the slow build, but it's I don't I don't I don't know how to describe it. It's just a one of a kind song, but I I, I think it's a gem of a song. If if there was ever a song that just was such an outlier on a metal album, but yet was like fit perfectly, um, 
Man, I gotta say, like, when they performed this live and uh, Annette would sat down in the stool and they, like, dimmed down the lights and Tuomas was playing the piano parts, I, I thought li- just the visual of it all live was so cool. I, I, it really, like, I felt like I was uh, in a, a 1930s jazz club. Like, if you ever watched the show Boardwalk Empire, it would have been, like, perfectly fit. Um, just, you know... I don't even know if this is a song that like they would could get away with with Floor and definitely not with Taria. Like this was this was such a perfect song for um for Annette. And and um I believe the whole uh like story of the album is kind of like this guy on his deathbed kind of re um kind of rehashing like all of the moments of his life. So presumably he was uh there in the in the thirties <laughs> at some jazz club hearing some uh sultry vocalist uh you know but yeah like this is just so um especially at the time it was so unexpected from nightwish and they really i think they really yeah, nailed it uh, here no question and then when you need that pick me up to come afterwards they give you i want my tears back which is like the perfect complement to this jazzy ballad a, a, a heavy aggressive but catchy song melodic very straightforward but the bagpipes just make this thing absolutely pop. And, and like, there's, it's kind of a simple song. Also, stop, stop playing it live. Yeah. If Marco's not in the yeah, band, I, don't want to I know, this song I know. Live. Um, it, this, this has a little bit of everything. Some amazing drum fills. The verses are just tailor made for Annette's vocals. And I'm going to just say something because every time I hear this song, it makes me go back and think, but, there's an instrumental section towards the end of this song. It is a exact replica of Iron Maiden's Dance of Death. I mean, like, to, to the T. But I'll give them a pass because the rest of the song is awesome and really catchy. But, like, I can't hear this song and not think of Iron Maiden every single time. Yeah. Interesting. Um, this is, um, I believe, one of the, fir- uh, one of the earlier... I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to research this just to make sure I'm right. But um, this is a, one of the earlier appearances mm-hmm. of Troy, um, who would later go on to become a full time member of the band. Actually, Dark Passion. Wait, he's Plague on there, but not but sparingly. Whereas I think he's kind of more of a factor on this. Yeah, he's. Yeah, so he's considered a guest musician on on that album and this album as well. But you can really hear his influence on this track, and. Um, Later on, later on in the outro, um, the outro track, um, and then also, so those were the, uh, you know, him doing the, the pipes and then, um, then you get a lot of the tin whistle stuff, um, which you heard in that, in that intro track. And then you'll hear, hear again on, uh, turn loose the mermaids and the crow, the owl and the dove, which are kind of two of the, um, two of the more, uh, like folky kind of sounds. And, and Troy, I think really brought this, this. Uh, uh, I think he's a big part of where this musical shift started to happen, where Nightwish became, um, they started to kind of, in my opinion, kind of tone down the power metal and tone up the folk metal. And so, because when you have those kind of pipes, you know, pipes and tin whistle and, and that kind of thing. And then he plays other instruments I can't even pronounce, the Badaran and the, the Bazooki, and uh, I think there's a Vuvuzela at one point. Um, the guy's like an instrumental, like, you know, Mozart. And so uh, it's it's definitely noticeable. I think in the Islander, too, you can kind of get some of that Absolutely. on the previous album. But, yeah, like, it's it makes sense that he would uh, be asked to, to join the band because um, – I think that he really has a lot to do with what their sound is now, but I, I don't know. I think this time period with like, you know, you you have your heaviest Marco influence, Troy's coming in there and that this is like her, you know, magnum opus. If we'll just use all of the, all of the tropes, um, you know, uh, even Kai Hato, who is their current drummer, uh, has a little bit of, um, he does a little guest percussion on this album. So it, it's, you know, the future of the band is already poking its way through at this point. Um, but uh, yeah, um, 
again, I'm just, you know, I'm belaboring every song, but whatever. I love this album. Um, you really are getting that vibe, that, uh, that Troy vibe that, um, by the next album, he would be a full-time member of the band right. along with that's Floyd. right. Um, we get into scare tale, which is kind of an interesting track. I'm going to reserve judgment on this. I want to hear your thoughts um, because it, it too sounds nothing like anything that comes before it or really anything that comes after it on this album. Yeah, this is um, this kind of uh, it, it brings me back to kind of like century child uh, once era Nightwish, where that with those like really um, those keyboard orchestrations that are almost like um, they sound like a core, like a like a that core, like kind of choral group or whatever. Um, this one is kind of more a little bit more of the older older school Nightwish vibe where. Um, it's more of the classic, uh, classic orchestrations, not as much of the folk stuff, but, um, it's also like really creepy and, and dark and, and like, um, it, it kind of reminds me of, uh, that what's the, that Halloween movie mm. uh, nightmare before mm-hmm. Christmas. Is that what it was called? Kind of feels like it would have been right at home on, on the, uh, that, that this, soundtrack. And you hit the nail on the head. I think that of all the tracks on this album, this is the one that sounds more like old Nightwish than the others in spots. And there's other spots where it sounds like modern Nightwish and stuff that you might hear on their next album. Like it's, it's kind of a transitional track. That being said, I absolutely adore this track and I'm going to make it my song of the week. Let's take a listen and then I'll explain why. I think that of all the tracks that Annette recorded with this band, this was her best vocal performance. And she does stuff on this track that no disrespect. I don't think Tarja could ever do. And in a certain way, it's the one song that I don't think floor would be great at. It's there's this spookiness element combined with that pop sound that is really, really, really unique. And that's what kind of draws me to this track. Yeah, it's fast. Yeah, it's heavy. Yeah, it's spooky. It's got that orchestration. Um, and it's like a trip through a haunted house, which, which is just really, really cool. Um, but it's, it's the way that Annette sings this track, which I think is her, literally her best performance on any recorded piece of music that I've heard that just makes this song pop for me. Uh, and that's why I have it as my song of the week. It's, there's really no, uh, no arguments for me. And, and then again, another, um, another track that features, uh, Marco's vocals as well. Um, it's, it's a musically just, a, it's like a, a roller coaster ride through a haunted there, there house. Like it's, it's, yeah, it's, um, just really a, really a fun and, and creepy kind of song. And, and, um, man, I, were you able to figure out how long it had been since you listened to this album start to finish? It was, it was years for me. I hadn't listened to this to album. To be start honest, I, I can't say exactly, but I think I listened to it about a year ago. I, I this is an album I, I go back to semi regularly for an album that came out over a decade ago. Not as long as you would think, just because I, I love it, and and it's an album that like when I want to hear some Annette, this is what I wind up putting on. You know, eight times out of ten. Uh, okay, interesting little uh, factoid. I think you'll enjoy. Um, Scare Tale is about childhood nightmares, being Nightwish's version lyrically of Metallica's huh. Enter Sandman, and also homages the Disney song "Grim Grinning Ghosts" with Scare Tale's 
original ti- uh, working title having been Haunted well, Mansion. Well, I guess Ryan. we hit the nail on the head then, didn't we? Because I did not know that when I said it, but it yeah. makes perfect sense to me. I was at Disney World a couple of months ago and I was on the Haunted Mansion and it actually made me think of this song. So they, they definitely hit the nail on the head with this one. No, no question about it. I would I would go to Disney World more often if rides had <laughs> Nightwish songs playing. Or just watch The Simpsons, one or the other. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll have to mention that uh, towards the end when we get to the news because that was that. I feel like that almost kind of uh, was like a perfect timing considering us choosing this album this uh, this week. But anyway, um, yeah. This this is such a, a fun tune, and and again, like it goes to the what I was saying before about just these wild changes oh, yeah. in song types from song to song. You know, it's just uh, really. The, really impressive. Yeah, no, 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 no. I, I, I agree. Um, another change in direction would be the next track, which is an instrumental, kind of like a postscript to Scare Tale, and that's Arabesque. It has a very, very strong Middle Eastern vibe to it. It's certainly very aptly named. A little nondescript. I, I don't know what I can otherwise say other than it's just kind of provides a nice postscript before we get to another ballad and turn loose the mermaids. Um, do you have any thoughts of that or any thoughts on the ballad that would follow? No, actually I think it kind of serves as like a, a little bit of a break because like, I feel like they really just smashed you in the face with those first handful of songs. Like even, even uh, slow love slow. I mean, obviously it's not going to be remembered as like a, a power metal <laughs> anthem. Um, it, but it hits you, man. Like it just hits you in a different kind of way. But like, these are like really all very strong songs. So followed by another bunch of really strong <laughs> songs. So I think this is almost like perfectly placed. It's kind of like the, the, uh, the Sherbert palate cleanser, if you will, uh, of, of Imaginarium. Um, so it's fine. I mean, it's probably the least memorable song on the album, but I mean, I think that it, it's there to serve a purpose more than anything else. Um, and again, you know, it's Nightwish, so you got to have your your dramatic uh, instrumental, you know, orchestral, symphonic, instrumental tune. So this kind of serves that that yeah, purpose. Yeah, I, I think that's. I'll be honest. I, I kind of forgot I, I about think it. That's, until I think we, that's I well said. Again. Um, Turn Loose the Mermaids would be the second of, 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 of the ballads, and it's not the last one by any means. Annette kind of kicks us off with this little sublime vocal solo. I think the wind instruments are a nice touch. You don't get a lot of that on the prior on the prior songs. I think this is a touch less ambitious than Slow Love Slow. I enjoy it. It's just not my favorite ballad, and I think there's still yet a better one that comes a little bit later on. So it's, it, it's I don't know, I, I just, not my favorite, but it's okay. It's okay. Yeah, this one's this one's more like the Islander was on Dark Passion Play. Um, just like uh, very folky with the the pipe sounds. Um, I think I'd mentioned earlier. This is another one of the songs that Troy plays the pipes on, and um, I really like this song. Um, again, uh, I, I'm going to echo what you just said. There's a ballad that I happen to like even more uh, coming up, but um, this one is another one that I kind of forgot about and it, the when it gets to like the middle of it and it almost has that like spaghetti western meets like karate <laughs> kid like i don't even know how to explain it it's just uh, really cool um with the whistling and everything it's it almost feels like um it really feels like a uh like there's gonna be a western Country Western shootout, but in Okinawa. <laughs> Maybe um, that's the uh, OK Corral which, too. I, I I don't know. Um, yeah, d- don't ask me where that one's coming from. But um, I just really like this a lot. I, I, it's again another really great um, performance from Annette. Uh, it's got Troy's fingerprints all over it. I like this song a lot. I think um, the the thing about this album is that like even as different as all the tracks sound, they're all just, they all just really nail whatever it is they're trying to do. Like if, whether it's a, a, a jazz, a jazz solo vocal piece or, or instrumental or, a, or a power metal banger or, or just a kind of a, a more folky traditional ballad like this, like every song is just like great at what it, it's set 
to where yeah, it's there to do. I, I, which... I, I would agree with that. I, I think that it's hard to live up to the perfection that is the front half of this album. So Turn Loose the Mermaids and even Rest Calm, the next track, take a step back, not, not five steps back, but a step back just in terms of how good a, a composition it is or they are. Um, this one is a heavier song. It's a little bit slower pace for sure. Um, Marco's vocals are really just awesome over that chunky riff that's, that's on this song. And I, what I do like is the really heavy, the contrast between the heavy verses with Marco and the lighter, more um, ephemeral sound with a net on the chorus. That, that to me is cool. It's just a bit repetitive and the song goes a little bit long. Um, Rest Calm is just under seven minutes. I, I, I like this song. I don't love it. It, it's, it's, it takes away from this album from being perfect to me, but it's damn near close. Uh, yeah, I like I I like this one just fine. It's not one of my favorites. I like that it kind of has a, a a more of a mid tempo kind of vibe to it. Again, um, more you're getting more of the Marco flavor in there. Um, of all things, would you believe that um, this was inspired by bands like Paradise Lost and My no, Dying Bride? No, I would Ride. never guess um, that. They were kind of going for going for a little bit of a nice. doom kind of vibe to it, which is really interesting um and i don't know who this is in quotes i don't know who said that though it just says this is a melodic song that gets totally out of hand yeah. in the end yeah, there you go <laughs> so uh, very 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 good i i like that i like that description um the the next track though now we start getting back into the really good stuff because you you there's a, a couple of tracks in a row here which are just for my money as good as it gets and the first is the crow the owl and the dove this is a sleeper track that's kind of buried on the back end and, and I don't think gets talked about enough. There's this acoustic guitar sound, which is phenomenal. And a, the vocal duet at the beginning of this song just kicks this thing off the right way. It's, it's a ballad in spots, a power ballad in others. I just think it's a really good composition. And I feel like this song is maybe the most underrated on the entire album. Uh, this is my go. song of the week. I, um, I, I love this song. Um, I always have. And I think that as time goes on, it, it just slowly has crept up as my favorite song on this album. Um, it's just absolute perfection as far as a, a ballad goes. Um, beautiful vocals from both Marco and Annette. The orchestrations. And again, it's another one of those tracks where the the with the orchestrations just build. It starts out mellow and then that that build um it, it happens a, on a lot of tracks on this album it, it almost feels like Thomas is really finding this like this way of like kind of starting you off and building and building and building and crescendoing and then till the end where you're just like yes like you get the this payoff is, um, that, that you're that you're kind of waiting another for. song like that and, and yeah and it, this one is kind of like the the ballad version of, of that um so I, I, it's interesting. I would never have guessed that I would choose a, a softer song as like a, a track of the week for a Nightwish album. Um, cause I, I think shit, I think like the one I chose on Oceanborn was probably one of the, the heavier and faster songs on the album. But, um, this is just a beautiful, beautiful song. Um, again, you're, you're getting that, um, you're getting that, uh, Troy, influence i think um i think this is one of the songs where he um he he has the uh, plays the tin whistle which again always reminds me of that karate kid soundtrack um that that real uh like you know far east kind of vibe which is great um again just everything just really comes together and i feel like the song is just really great i Let's love hear it. it so uh shall we uh give it a listen
was a really good choice, and I'm, I'm glad you selected it because it gives me another excuse to listen to it this week. I would not have guessed that. I, I would have – part of me would have thought you would have went with the next track, which is Last Ride of the Day, because this is like the last of the true nods to the old power metal bangers of a tune. Uh, and it's interesting because as catchy as this song is and as awesome as this song is with the subtle keyboard melodies and the drums that kind of push this song forward, um, it's a simple song, which I which is just so catchy that there's nothing not to love. But in my opinion, they should have ended the album with that song. It's a little weird to me that they would sing a song, Last Ride of the Day, go on that amazing journey. And then all of a sudden you have still 20 minutes of music left after that song. It's kind of weird. And it almost takes me out of it a little bit, which I'll, I'll get to in, in momentarily. Talk a little bit about last ride of the day and your thoughts. Uh, yes. I just wanted to point out um, that the previous track, um, the crow, the owl and the dove is actually the only uh, song on the album that, um, anyone else had songwriting credits on uh, Marco co-wrote that song with Tuomas and uh, Tuomas said in an interview, it's kind of funny that the most poppy ballad on the album is composed by the most yeah, metalhead dude That's in the right. band. So, and um, it also contains some of uh, Troy's lead vocals um, before the tin whistle solo. So like, that's kind of a little bit of a harbinger of things to come because he's been doing a lot more, uh, vocals with the band with Marco being gone. Um, very different vocalist. He's a good singer, just, uh, very different from, from Marco. But, uh, yeah, Last Ride of the Day is, um, it's one of my favorite songs on the album. I think it's become a staple of like, um, I don't know that it's always the very last song, but Nightwish does play it towards the end of their sets. I think it was the last song during the Imaginarium tour, which it, it, it makes sense. Um, I might, have some disagreement with you on on the um the rest of the album after this but uh we'll, we'll get we'll get to that when we get to it but um this is just um i mean this is just your a nightwish just gem you know like it's pretty much what you want from a nightwish song it, it's got those um those just recognizable like guitar riffs and and the um to the orchestrations and the the build and and just uh, everything, everything about that makes Nightwish great is kind of all rolled up into the song. I'm, I'm almost, I'm almost every time I hear it, I'm almost surprised that it's only like a four and a half minute song because it yeah. feels so much more epic well, than, than yeah, that. I, I think that, um, yeah, I think that part of the, of the reason it feels epic is because of the contrast between that and the next song, which actually is the epic 13 and a half minute track on the album. And I should, I should mention, um, the last ride of the day is inspired by being on a roller coaster. Uh, so I think that that is a various, uh, a very astute and obvious point. In so far as it feels like it, right? It feels like you're again, you're at that amusement park and you're kind of on 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 a coaster or something like that. Um, my biggest issue with "Song of Myself," and again, it clocks into nearly fourteen minutes. There's about six minutes towards the end of this song, which I think they could have just shaved off and it was almost like self-indulgent in a way. What I like about it is that it's all, it's less Nightwish than it is Epica. To me, this sounds like an Epica tune. And I feel like all you needed were growling vocals and you this could have been on one of the Epica albums around this time period. Very, very heavy on the orchestration. Very, very symphonic and a good song, but it just it drags a little for me towards the end. And there's these spoken word part that I just... I don't know. I just, I, I just don't get it maybe. And I just don't understand the point of that. So I, it loses me. And then it goes into Imaginarium, the track, which is like this extended symphonic instrumental outro. And although it's cool, it reminds me of like a Final Fantasy tr soundtrack or something like that. There's not really much noteworthy. And it was kind of a letdown considering how awesome the rest of the album is. The, this album loses me the last like 10 or 12 minutes. And I think that's what prevents it from being just a perfect album. Okay, um, I am I'll, taking all that into consideration. I um, <laughs> I, no, <laughs> I think I think that putting in the the narrations maybe 
maybe that could have just been a separate track because so this song is broken down into into four parts. And if you just take the actual song, I think it's a it's one of my favorite Nightwish songs. I think it's a fantastic tune. Um, I love that they they were playing it live and it was just the yes. meat of the song because it's a really I agree with you. It's great just a song. It's long just that what gets what gets lost in it is that at, at about the seven minute mark, there's it follows up about six and a half minutes of like ambient symphonic metal with these spoken narrations, and I understand that it's like part of of the story, but yeah, it is kind of like. I feel like it would take it would have taken me out of the album if it was somewhere like in the middle, but because to me like the prop the album proper ends at the seven minute right. mark of this song, and then everything else is almost kind of like an epilogue where you have this the narration part, and then the title track really it's funny that you mentioned Final Fantasy. It kind of reminded me of like the ending of a Final Fantasy game where they try to take all of the major musical themes of the and entire credited. game yep. and roll it into like a credits. And so this almost feels like the credits of the album, not really part of the album proper. So to me, that's kind of how I look at the album where like the music, the real musical, the real musical heart of the album comes to an end at, 653 of this of this track so like the first 23 seconds are um the instrumental intro called from a dusty bookshelf then the following three minutes or so is all that great heart lying still which is like the first half of the song then then the second half of the song is called piano black where the song kind of slows down a bit and one of my favorite annette uh performances on the album um but that, but you know, like you said, the song ostensibly ends at, at about just shy of seven minutes, and then it, it kind of turns into more of a, a, a theatrical kind of situation. And and like you said, I had never seen the film before either, so I'm wondering if maybe this fits in better in a visual sense. And I will tell you, every time it opens up with that Scottish guy talking, I think of <laughs> Drew McIntyre. Like every time, I think it's Drew McIntyre narrating. Um, but yeah, like I said, like, um, the actual meat of the song, I think is one of the best songs on the album. And, and, um, if you look at it as like two separate parts of the music part and the, and the narration part, um, uh, the music part is great. And the narration part really is just kind of the end of the story followed by, like I said, this kind of, you know, credits, and, and I guess. That, that's very well taken and i think that if i just chopped off the let the end I, i'd probably be sometimes less is more and i think that would be the case here i understand the story elements but to me it's just not needed but again you want to complete the fact that this is a concept album that yada 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 um that that's the album and, and i will say that for my money it is the best nightwish album top to bottom despite the gripes that I pointed out and I only point them out because I want to be fair in, in terms of my recap of the album. Um, but for my money, it is as good as it gets for Nightwish top to bottom. I, I don't, I think I enjoy this more than any other by a pretty wide margin. I'm curious to see whether or not it tops Oceanborn and the 9.5 you gave that. Uh, I think it does. I, this is my favorite Nightwish album. Um, I think that, oh, man, I don't know that I could give it a 10. As I always kind of looked at it as like a 10 album. Um, it's like just a, just like a tad shy. I, I, I'm going to give this probably the, the best rating you can give something without giving it a 10 and I'm going to give it a, a 9.875. There you go. <laughs> and, I, and I completely understand that. And and for me, it's a 9.25 I, I, for the reasons that I kind of outlined earlier. I think that the back half is a little less than the front half. I think that it gets a little long in the tooth at the end, like I mentioned, but this is a phenomenal album. My only hope is that they can one day get back to this level because the last album, I, I just it wasn't even close and it was missing something. And I'm just curious to see how they pull it all together for the next one, because needless to say, I'll be listening. Yeah. Um, I feel like, so, you know, 
I after listening to this, I was like, okay, I got to go back and listen to uh, to Endless Swarm's Most Beautiful, which you know, I think it has a has a lot of similarities to this to Imaginarium, but just happens to have floor on it. I think that you're getting there's more of the Troy influence. Um, like I said before, like this album took me longer to grasp onto and there's still songs on it that I think are I think that the the um the the songs that I don't love as much I don't like as much as the songs I don't love as right. much on Imaginary if I that you. makes sense. Like they're a little bit more it feels a little bit more fillery. That said, the songs that I do love on this album, I mean, I would argue Shudder Before the Beautiful and The Greatest Show on Earth are two of my favorite Nightwish songs ever. Um, Greatest Show on Earth is, to me, I was like, oh, great, Nightwish made a 24-minute song. This is gonna, this is just going to be, like, drudgery. And it's, I think it's one of the best songs the band ever made. It's, um, it's to me, it's just fantastic. Um it, I think it, it kind of, it's almost like they took Last Ride of the Day and turned it into an epic. And, um, but then there's just some other songs where I'm just kind of like, meh. Um, I think, uh, Weak Fantasy is a fantastic song. Yours is an Empty Hope, um, another Marco Fest, which was featured on an episode of The Simpsons of all friggin' things that just aired, uh, a week ago. Um, I, I sent it to, was it, were you the one who asked me? Was yes, this, was this dub? Did somebody dub were... this over? Yeah. And I was like, "This no, this is the this is the episode." Um, so I do think that this album was a, a bit of a, a step down from Imaginary, but also like, how could it not be? That album was was damn near perfect, in my opinion. Um, it, it's what it's it, it's going from this to to human nature, where I feel like there's a significant drop off um oh no i was gonna say i i i I agree it was a significant drop off and i think that in due time we will probably cover endless forms because it's a natural progression as we've kind of gone through the the band's history um i've not listened to it in a while i just remember it never grabbing me as much as as imaginarium but that's partially because the album was so damn good that i'm not sure anything would have would have captured that moment or captured that sound but yeah uh it does have its moments for sure and like i said i i, I would be a, an album that i would love to do in long form you know down the line absolutely um i actually really like the title track as well i think that's a, a catchy catchy tune um i i just don't know like what's happening now um like human nature i i thought was was a a, a very I thought it was a very good album, but like, I'm not looking to Nightwish to make very good albums. I'm looking to Nightwish to make like great to excellent to damn near perfect albums. And right now, we've done two Nightwish albums. I've yet to to give one less than a nine point five. Um, you know, this is an all like an all time favorite band for me. Clearly, um, so yeah, like they that album still made my top. 50 list but like the fact that it was like 27 or whatever the hell it it ended up on it's like boy i mean that's disappointing like if it's like if a halloween album wasn't a a top three for the year like you just it's it's an it's automatically disappointing just because they're meant to do so much better than that i Um, i I totally understand um we'll, we'll we'll definitely circle back to this and speaking of circling back you know I had mentioned the gripes that I had with the Wasp tour, not in terms of the performance, but just because I thought it was too good to be true, if you will. And it was very good, but just too good, right? So apparently Blackie Lawless was asked a question to this effect at a at a VIP meet and greet at one of their most recent shows in Florida. And he had this to say, right? He's he's he said, um, he was asked, you know, whether or not backing tracks were being used during the live performances. And he gave an honest answer. So I'm going to give credit where credit is due. He goes, quote, to answer your question, yes, we are using backing tracks. You want to know why? When we go into a studio, and let me clarify that statement, 
That's me singing. But when we go in a studio, we do the choruses, we do double, triple, quadruple the vocals. So my feelings were that when I listened to the live YouTube recordings of shows and we weren't doing that, it sounded thin. That's when we started supplementing it. It sounded better. He goes, I'm a, if I'm a fan and I'm coming to a show, I want that thing to sound as good as it can. There are other bands like Queen, for example. They can't duplicate 24 vocals at one time. Uh, editor's note, I, I, I think Freddie Mercury can do anything, but that's when you got to go. Uh, that's what they do on the records. And if you want it to sound like those records, you got to have some help. Now, in my defense, I guess that's what you're asking. Is it fair for a band to go out and only use those? No, it's not fair. But like I said, I take a lot of pride in what I do. And for the lead vocals that I do, um, it comes in handy to have the background or the orchestration. So he's, he's admitting to it. I, I don't know. I'm not suggesting that he wasn't singing on those live shows. He was singing. I'm just saying that there was a lot of help, and he admits it. So at least I know I'm not crazy. Sure. Sounds like sounds like damage control to me. I'm but. not arguing. But listen, he could have he could have denied there, the whole so. thing, right? Listen, I saw Black Sabbath's last run of shows a couple of years ago. Ozzy did the same thing. There's no way that Ozzy and Blackie Lawless could sound better now than they did in 1986. It's just not possible. Um. Sure. Um. I, I, there's something I wanted to bring uh, bring up. I, it, ju- just as you were starting to talk about it, uh, it's it's kind of circling back to um, Nightwish. Um, I saw this quote. I wanted to read you this quote, but I'm not going to tell you who said it until after I read you the quote because I think you'll appreciate um, and maybe even be a little surprised at who said it. Um, the quote goes, uh, when I heard Dark Passion play, I couldn't believe it. I thought, now this is a proper fucking album. It's got everything bar the kitchen sink in there. It was controversial because of the new singer, but she was brilliant. No disrespect to Taria, but Annette's voice suited them a lot better. There's heavy stuff, classical, even a bit Disney, all kinds of shit in there. I think it's one of the best sounding albums I've ever heard in my life. Then I got the next one, Imaginarium. Storytime is a fantastic instant song. The rest of the album took me a while to get into. Dark Passion Play was so good, I thought there was no way they could ever come up with an album that's anywhere near that. But the more I got into Imaginarium, the more I loved it. Who said it? Steve wow, Harris of Iron Maiden. Get Man. out of here. See, and it's funny. They had Within Temptation <laughs> yep. on tour with them. Bring out Nightwish for the next run. How awesome would that be? Yeah. But Steve Harris, go figure. So I thought that was really – And, and – Yeah, I thought that was cool. very timely because next week, request week here at the, at, at the Metal Exchange, and we had put up a poll on our social media page, uh, Metal Exchanges at Facebook, and we had asked which Bruce era album – Everyone wanted to hear, and it was kind of close, but the winner was 1984's Power Slave. So we're going to talk about some Steve Harris next week when we, when we talk about uh, Iron Maiden Power Slave. I am psyched. Will you, will you be at a <laughs> loss for words? I, I assure you, I am never at a loss for words. And, and the only thing is they were because it's an instrumental. But I digress. The, the fact of the matter is that's going to be a fun discussion. We have not talked about some Bruce Dickinson uh, or at least some studio stuff by them in a whole forever because we haven't done an album the the only maiden album we did was with paul diano and that's when we did killers so i'm very much looking forward to this yeah um we're gonna drop the episode at 11 58 p.m uh next, in tribute uh, next to, monday uh don't set your alarms <laughs> though I, you it, can't, it, uh, but uh yeah <laughs> this this is this is a, a fun one i i don't know that it's my favorite yeah this is this is an album where um, I don't know any of the songs right, in the you, middle. It's like, it's like <laughs> I, the Oreo like the, cookie. I, you know the beginning <laughs> and the end, but you don't know the middle. But uh... Yeah, it's very it's weird. It's like, I, you know, I, I obviously the first two tracks and the last two tracks and then the three and the, the four in the middle, I'm like, these might as well be brand new songs to me. So um, it'll be interesting to hear this all, uh, you know, together as one uh, unit. Um, I, I'm excited because I do know so many people consider this the the real. Uh... I didn't get that. Oh, shut up, Siri! Nobody asked you. Um, just like the the you know, I, I wouldn't. I don't think Iron Maiden has a magnum opus because they have too many albums that are just considered like all time classics. But I know a lot of people consider this their favorite um, amongst you know a lot of good ones like Number of the Beast and Peace of Mind and Somewhere in Time. So. Uh, you know, this I'm, is this is interesting. I'm looking, I I don't really know my Iron Maiden album start to finish. It's it's really odd. I just never I I like got into like their thirty or so, maybe forty best songs, but just never 
dug into the the deeper tracks. So this will be another. Uh, I remember being surprised at how much I enjoyed yeah. Killers. Uh, I enjoyed it a lot more than I thought I would. So um, I'm looking forward to kind of learning some more um, some more songs. I had a when I was in college, I actually had a Tail Gunner poster in my room and I never even, I don't think I know that's I've hysterical. ever heard the song. I just thought the poster was really cool. <laughs> that, that's really funny. Uh, yeah. I think you're in for a treat. Um, this, this song, this album has very good bookends, but I, I assure you the cream in the middle of the cookie is good on this one too. Uh, is it my favorite? Maybe. Uh, but I do have some interesting questions for you as it relates to this album, but I'll, I'll save them for next week. Uh, thanks to everyone for listening. We, we probably gone along with this one just because we, we love obviously imaginarium and there was a lot, a lot of meat on the bone there, but we'll bring you some iron maiden next week. And then we'll get into, uh, the end of December as we get towards our, um, best of 2022. I can't believe we're almost here. Yeah, I am very not very much not prepared to oh. have that discussion as of right now. I have uh, I have a month to get my ass in gear and and really uh, re listen to a lot. I have um I think four or five albums I haven't listened to at all yet. Um, Devin Townsend's album uh, being one of them, which um, I know Glenn Harvison posted uh, pretty high up on his list, which makes me a little bit more. Um, apt to want to to give it a listen because i understand it's actually um a bit more the album's actually called light work which is kind of funny because it's cons- i guess it, it's people are saying it's uh lighter that than some of the heavier the first seven stuff so the first disc is is the second disc has some really crunchy stuff on there it's the dichotomy between the two discs is pretty interesting but i'll let you come to your own conclusions uh yeah i think i actually only have the the one oh, okay. disc version. You, you, the second um, disc is really good. So, actually, I think some people prefer it to the first disc. So, definitely worth checking. Oh, out. okay. I'm gonna have to get. I'm gonna have to get the rest of it then. Um, and I haven't listened. To, uh, I, I think I mentioned this last time. I still haven't listened to uh, the new Threshold I think album, I listened to which it um, time is something week. that I've been uh, I'll let you draw your own conclusions. Oh. But I love that album. I really there's there's one song on there that could be my song of the year potentially. But again, I don't want to influence you. Take a listen. We'll, we'll we'll get back to it. Okay, yeah, and then that and then I have uh, Fallen Sanctuary, Mantric Momentum, and Fraternia to kind of round things out. Um, but yeah, there's a bunch of crap that I need to go back and listen to again. Um, just a lot of stuff that you recommended, stuff that um, I got and just listened to once and then kind of forgot about. Um, I got, uh, I'm looking at the list, I got Degreed, I got Moonlight Haze, Deep Sun, Fortis Ventus, Secret Rules, Zeon, um, Perpetual oh Fire, uh, I gotta give that Fellowship album a listen to again, Virtual Symmetry, Arcane Tales, New Horizon, these are just like the bands that I wasn't that familiar with going into this year, um, and then there's the bands I am familiar with that I need to re-listen to again. I mean, oh my god, I um, I'm so just not prepared for this. So uh, I feel pretty good about my top ten so far. It's just like everything after that it just starts to get like I don't know. It's like trying to compare one seven point five with another yeah. seven point five with another seven point five and deciding like which one is gonna go ahead of the next Throw them at- it's, I'm gonna give it my give, give it the my old, best uh, college though. try. Uh enjoy enjoy the next couple of days. We'll get back with some Iron Maiden for next week and uh we'll see where the road takes us. Enjoy the day buddy. I'll talk to you soon. Alrighty and uh we I I think uh won't be before the next time we talk but um I will uh, be seeing Trans-Siberian Orchestra um, next week. Um, So when we reconvene after uh, the Iron Maiden episode, um, I will share my thoughts on that um, because I haven't seen them in three years and they're one of my favorite, uh, favorite live acts and gets me really right into the holiday season. And it's especially nice when they come to your town at the right time and it's not like, before Thanksgiving or after Christmas where you're kind of like not in the spirit. And I think uh, December 1st or um, I think it's December 1st uh, is, is December yes. 1st Thursday or is that November 30th? Uh, yeah. I think that's like the perfect, uh, perfect time to see TSO just, you know, three weeks before Christmas. I like perfect. it. Enjoy the show. Uh, we will talk soon, buddy. Enjoy.
All right, take care.